Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, happy Friday. Thanks for tuning in to our Mac, uh, Mac study session here for the exam. Uh, I like to point out on this one here, this is for carpentry. And uh, you know, I can remember early in my career, my father said that I was so good at carpentry, I could be a finished carpenter. And I wasn't quite sure what he meant until he, the second line was, if anybody saw your work, you'd be finished. So just keep that in mind, just keep that in mind. I've improved over the years, have picked up a few trellis tapes, and uh, I think we'll be just fine on this exam. Uh, I wanted to point out, first off, the uh, significance of each one of these sections. If you look at the very top, it talks about plumber. Uh, the plumbing will be 14 questions. Carpentry will only be 11 questions but it still, uh, it still could be the difference between pass and failure. Electrical 20, general maintenance 24, HVAC 11, uh, power plant and boiler 11, and safety support services is nine. So 100 questions on this test. Uh, next, please. Very important date. So if you are gonna write something down, now's a great time if you got a pen and paper. Uh, the MAC, you know, exam, you have to register for it. You cannot just show up and, and then take the exam. You need to register. You have to register in time for the exam. So if you're planning on taking the exam in, in SoCal seminar, uh, you have to register by the 11th. And of course, this is the 5th. So you just have six days, six more days to register if you're going to take the exam in, in SoCal. If you're going to take the the exam in uh, NorCal, which is up here in Fairfield, uh, you need to register by September the 15th. So these are hard dates. You really need to make sure you get registered and and um, and be ready for the for the test by then. Uh, to register, make sure that you you look at uh, the site. It's got the the, the uh, website here below. You can see that, but you can also look at it on our CSU site as well. Uh, next, please. Uh, real quick, uh, we have a hand raised from Joe Bird. Okay. Hey, Joe, go ahead. I think I accidentally pressed it, but I do have a question. If it's my sure. first time taking the test with two years experience uh -huh. and I score well enough, do you get the senior certificate or you have to wait for the five years or does it go by the test score? Beth, I don't know about that one. Um, that's a very good question that I will have to get back to you on later today, if that's okay. <laughs> no, yeah, uh, no problem. Yeah. But a good question. Yeah, I, will, good question. I will let you know. Thank you. All right. Any other questions with regards to taking the test and, and location and time deadline to register? Oh, oh, once, twice, three times. Okay. Let's go to the next slide, please. All right, for the carpentry section, you know, the course objectives are going to be over the standard height of countertops and workbenches. That's one. How doors are sized, uh, types of wood, uh, joining methods, hinge types and applications, use of a tape measure and fractional math. That's a good one. Uh, basic uh, construction materials, uh, carpenter terms, and carpentry equipment. Uh, next, please. Uh, candidates should uh, also be coached to use the following steps when taking a multiple choice test, like the MAC certification test. Um, see other videos for tips and everything. Um, Angel put in here that he recently took the test in uh, Shaw Valley uh, Institute. Uh, his personal notes are take your time with taking the test. Uh, read and reread the questions, very important. Uh, eliminate two of the worst answers. Uh, bring bring a non-programmable calculator. No phones are allowed, so you can't use your calculator on your phone. Uh, and don't worry about 80% of the questions are from uh, working in healthcare. And uh, you get two hours, uh, mark the ones that you're iffy on and come back to it uh, if you have the time remaining, but definitely make sure you, you answer those questions. Next, please. Uh, this is a pretty good illustration. Now, this is uh, for the, you know, now remember this is a national test, but here is some uh, indicators. When you look at drawings and such on the carpentry, uh, you'll see something similar to this uh, for installation equipment and where it's mounted. Um, 
note that there's an A, A, E, K. And so the A is for adults, adult dimensions. If you were installing this for adult bathroom, E is for elementary children uh, bathroom and K is for kindergarten uh, bathroom. And so there's varying heights. So that's something to keep in mind. And of course, there's also ADA uh, considerations. But look at how things are, are measured from, you know, most things are measured from the floor up, not from the ceiling down, they're from the floor up. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, the sink height is a good example. You know, for an adult, it's 34 inches. Uh, for elementary kids, it's 29. For kindergarten, it's 24. So keep that in mind when you're looking at uh, dimensional things. It could be on the test as far as what height is this and from where. Everything is from the floor. So your floor is your what we call the data, your, your, your base measurement up. Uh, next, please. So when you look at doors, it's important to understand the terminology of, of the doors. Uh, the one to the left here, it talks about the top rail, the panels, uh, the locks, the, the bore hole, um, the bottom rail, the hinges, the mid rail, uh, the, uh, the stop molding, all those are compo uh, important components of a door. And knowing those components will help you as well. It could definitely be on a test, test question. To the right, if you look at the double swinging door right there, notice that one of the doors is different than the other. It has an, an asterisk on there that the second door is it has to literally have to close before the primary closes there. So, Keep those in mind when you look at doors and door jams, uh, the threshold and what the header is. Keep those in mind and what the trim is. So they, they could have a test question on that as well. Uh, next, please. Uh, the cabinetry. So, you know, cabinetry has a lot of components to it. Um, it's not that simplistic, but it's good to understand the basic components. Of course, the um, you know, what is the soft, the door bumpers that are installed on there? You know, or you've seen them when they're not there and the door closes with the spring loaded hinge and it bounces because they don't have a soft closure. Think about those components when you're ready to take these tests and it may have these components within there. Um, what is the, the, the bottom of the drawer, right? And so in healthcare, you know, a lot of this stuff, wood is not allowed in there. But, uh, but think about the different components, you know, that you have a, um, a rail that the drawer slides on and what that, what that looks like, what it could be, the different types of soft closure uh, drawers, under, under mounted, uh, full access, uh, what the face frame is, you know, that borders the face of it, and uh, the different door components as well, you know, solid wood um, frame door, and the different joints that are there. We're going to talk a little bit more about the different joints that are used for uh, carpentry and construction. Uh, next, please. This is this is a pretty busy slide, but I wanted to point out a few of these on the left hand side. If you look at the left hand side, the very top left hand corner, it talks about a butt joint. Okay, and so a, boint, a butt joint, if you look at it, it's just a nice. Uh, 90 degree cut on the wood and the two pieces of wood, they butt up and join together. Uh, if you look at the miter joint, you know, it, it's at an angle right there. And of course that angle is a 45 degree angle. If you're trying to make a 90 degree uh, frame off of that, if you're trying to make something else, it would be a different angle. Uh, but that's the, the miter joint. The dado joint or data, data joint, I've heard it explained, uh, pronounced a couple of different ways. You notice there's a, one of the pieces of wood has that cut in it, and that's you know it's usually done on a table saw with a, with a particular blade that actually makes the width of it can be adjusted as you go through there. But the other piece of wood has a butt cut, you know, which means it's just cut right off and it butts up into that that joint. So when you look at those general terms, they're used in other wood assembly and. Uh, for example, if you if you go down to um, three rows down into the middle, you see where it says the data and rabbit joint right there. So you know there's two different pieces. You're looking at that that joint again, a cut again, 
but now it's being uh, used differently. It has a rabbit cut that is um, a notch out of that wood at the very end. And you can kind of see that that's there. The other piece I wanted to really um, have you uh, focus on is when they talk about, they talk about a rabbit cut, but then they talk about a blind rabbit cut. And a blind rabbit cut, if you look at the very bottom left-hand corner of that, you'll see it says a notched, uh, a corner notch cut, and then you've got a blind rabbit cut. When those two pieces of wood come together, you cannot see that rabbit cut anymore because it's covered. So it's a blind rabbit cut. So just kind of keep that in mind when you look at the terminology and you look at these and you may have a test question that is, that is unique, but it's using parts of those. And that helps you eliminate some of the wrong uh, possible answers. And next slide, please. Hinge types. So there's a lot of different hinge types. And um, we're going to go through a little bit of these. And some are on, definitely on some of the practice test questions. So the ball bearing hinge is there. So you can imagine a door that is pretty heavy or, you know, it may need a ball bearing hinge door so it slides, you know, closes easily. A uh, butt hinge, you know, that's going to butt up against something. But a piano hinge is probably one that you're going to see a lot in healthcare for very heavy doors. You'll see this piano hinge, which literally goes almost the length of the door a lot of times. Uh, the flush hinge, you'll see that in cabinetry, used in cabinetry quite a bit. Uh, you'll see in the bottom left hand corner, we talk about a spring hinge that's used for self closing doors, you know, where you want the door to have some to close onto. Uh, I'm not sure how much I've seen that in healthcare, but you have seen that in maybe the office side of the medical office buildings, it's possible. The pivot hinge door, that's the one where you really, you're trying to swing out. That's a unique um, uh, hinge. Uh, you don't see a lot of it, but, but you could, but it could be on a test question. Uh, the concealed hinge right there, that is something that you would see in uh, cabinetry. And we'll, we'll take another look at that here shortly. Uh, next, please. So here, looking at uh, how to distinguish hinge types in a full overlay, half overlay, or insert. Now that's something to keep in mind. And if you look at that center row, uh, it's, it's a little bit easier to see in the white and black uh, lay there. You see that the one on the very, um, very left, you know, it, it literally is a full overlay, right? So it's fully, that door is totally going over that side panel, right? So the door plate is going all the way over the side panel. That's a full overlay. If you look at the one in the center, it's a half overlay. It's halfway over that side panel. And if you look at the one to the right, it, it's definitely an insert. So the door is actually inserted into that side panel. And so you're going to use different types of hinges to, to sometimes to make those different um, openings. And we'll talk about that here, right after this slide here. Next, please. Uh, you know, tape measure. So I, I always try to keep in mind when I do these presentations, not everybody's a carpenter. I could be speaking to a plumber, which knows how to use tape measure, but it could be an electrician, which doesn't measure that much. But these are pretty good, and there's some things that uh, we'll point out and using a tape measure and how you use it. Um, definitely want to make sure that, you know, you grasp the degree. And this looks like a pretty gnarly piece of wood, uh, a little bit hard to mark on, but uh, but we'll, we'll go into a little more detail on that. Next, please. So when you see a, a tape measure, a lot of times, you know, if it's, um, if it's in inches, they'll have um, usually the different graduates that, that are on there. They'll have a 16th, which is the shortest line that's on there, and 16th of an inch. The next longest line will be at eighths. The next longer line will be in quarters. The next longer line is a half, and then the line that goes all the way across will be in inches. So if you look at that graduation from left to right, you can see that it's, it's going down. It's getting longer as you go into the different uh, fractions of an inch. Uh, next, please. So fraction wall. Uh, I like this uh, slide. It's pretty good. Uh, I wish I had this when I was teaching uh, fractions in, uh, in college. Um, but inch is 
there's one hunt, you know, one over one is an inch, right? A half, we know what a half is, but this kind of starts to lay out how we break things up. We're talking about the unit, you know, the, the number at the top being the entire piece of it. And then the unit at the bottom is how many of those pieces make up the whole. So, you know, a third of an inch, there's three of them. A quarter of an inch, there's four of them to, uh, to an inch. A uh, fifth of an inch is there's five, six. And then when you get down to the eight, so, and 12. So you can have different graduates, uh, graduations in a tape measure, but there's very, the most common are gonna be uh, the eighth of an inch, uh, the quarter of an inch, and the half of an inch. Uh, next, please. The so fractions operation, this is a tricky wick. I'm probably not gonna be able to teach you fractions in, in a few, just a few um, minutes here. But I thought I would go ahead and at least show this to you, uh, just to kind of, you know, get your thinking cap back on. So if you if you have a quarter of an inch plus two quarters of an inch, right, would be three quarters of an inch. I know that sounds very simplistic, but you also have to remember that two quarters of an inch is two one eighth. So when we start adding fractions up, and there's a reason why I'm bringing this up, and you'll see it in the next slide or two. Um, the if you look in the purple you see the changes of equivalent fractions and common denominators and then add it for examples. So if you had to add a third of an inch plus a quarter of an inch, you know, how do you do that, right? Well, you have to make the uh, denominator, that's the number at the bottom, a common to both. And so uh, I always used to call out what I call the fair rule. If you do something to the bottom, you have to do something to the, do the same thing to the top. So the one third uh, fraction uh, you want to have uh, you want to have it into 12. So the reason you want to have it into 12 is that you figure that out. If you take three times four, it's 12, right? So you're going to change both of those fractions into 12. And the change is that if you if you take the number three, you're going to have to take and multiply it times four. That would give you a 12. And if you're going to take the bottom number times uh, four, then then you're going to have to take the top number times four. So that's how you get four 12s. You know, and, and the same thing with the one fourth. If you're going to take the four times three at the bottom, you have to take the one times three at the top, and that's how you get uh, three twelves. And so it's then it's very easy to add uh, four twelves plus three twelves equals seven twelves. That's how you get that fraction. And there's a reason why I brought this up, kind of went through it, and you'll see it here coming up very shortly. Next slide, please. So adding uh, fractions with common core, and that's kind of what we just kind of went through, uh, how you uh, you can cross multiply and go through there. Um, it's a little bit trickier here, you know, but we're talking about uh, taking us for example, number one is kind of what we just went through. Um, so if you had uh, three times five is 15, you'd have to have five times uh, one at the top, which would be two times five is 10. Uh, you had to take three times five at the bottom of the one on the right, so you'd have to have three times the four, which would give you the 12, so the 10, the 12, and then you would add that up. Uh, we did 22, I guess, over 15. That's where you, you, uh, you get your fraction of 22 fifteenths. And there's a reason we bring this up. I know I, I didn't want to get spooked on the test and thinking this is what the test is about but it's just a little bit of common uh, fractional, um, uh, how to deal with fractions if you in, ended up having a really tough question. It's the last one. You can take some time and go through that. Uh, next, please. Here's why. <laughs> Here's why we went through that exercise. So if you have, uh, you know, here's a project that it has uh, some cabinetry. It looks like it has a, uh, uh, a toe kick at the bottom, and you see it has a, a thick uh, uh, a countertop at the uh, you know countertop at the top. Of course, you have the rails there. How would you measure to get to a certain uh, point? Well, you have to add sometimes mixed fractions. And if you see going through here, we have the fractions of a half an inch. We have fractions of three quarters of an inch, a quarter of an inch, three eighths of an inch, and uh, and so to add those up, you have to know how to do that with uh, 
with by adding adding fractions. You have to know the different denominators and how to deal with that. So not that, that I think it's going to be a big test question, but it could be. And so um, it's a lot easier dealing with millimeters. So you'll figure that out later, I'm sure. But anyhow, so if you look to the very uh, left, you see the X, you know, as far as what is that height, how would you get that, right? So there's a couple ways to get to X. You would take, uh, one is to take the 30 plus the four and a half. So you'd have 34 and a half inches would make X, right? So that's one way, of course. Another way would be, uh, you know, if you were to uh, take the different components and add those up, you'd get there. But do the easiest way first and um, look for those, uh, those solutions. If you had to have what the total height was, if you notice that it says the top plate there, the, the countertop is one and a half inches, you would take that 34 and a half that you added up to for X and add the one and a half inches and there you'd have 35, 36 inches would be your, your top of that uh, countertop. Uh, next please. And here's another one. So this uh, could be a, a test question on it. It says the panels are three quarters of an inch thick, right? What X uh, should be cut? You know, what is what is X? So X, if you look at that, it's inside of that panel. And now we're not dealing in inches, we're dealing in centimeters, right? And so that's the, the key to, to look to see whether or not we're dealing in inches or centimeters. Uh, but in this case, it's indicated in both, right? And so they're saying it's um, three quarters of an inch is where it should have a, an inch mark at the very top of three quarters uh, thick. That being said, what is X? And so if you look, there is a dimension at the very top there. This is 31 and a half inches, and that in, encompasses two of those panels. So it's going to be 31 and a half minus two of those three quarter inch uh, uh, panels, right? And so if you take uh, three quarters uh, plus three quarters, that's actually an inch and a half. And so if you take uh, 31 and a half minus an inch and a half, it would be X would equal 30 inches. Hope that, that uh, everybody followed that. If you don't raise your hand, it will we'll go through it. But, um, but that's a, that could be a good test question. So it's good to know your fractions of an inch um, and, uh, and try to go it that way. And next, please. Here's some common tools. Now, this is uh, common tools that's used in carpentry. Uh, you may have a hammer, which is a claw hammer, a uh, saw, uh, square, of course, your tool belt, your tape measure, circular saw, a vise, a drill, a plane, you know. And all of these uh, tools have, have very uh, unique or multiple uses, could be. Uh, the ones on the, on the right, or some of them are a little bit, um, I think this is a very old, old one. I actually, unfortunately, I still remember a lot of those tools. Uh, the brace and bit, that's the very top right-hand corner. You'll see a brace, and then, of course, there's a bit that goes in there. So you'll see a thing called a brace and bit. Uh, a breast drill that's right next to it. I actually remember using those. Um, well, I guess I'm older than I look, but any hopefully. Um, but if you look down through there, you'll see some pretty uh, unique tools, um, the chisels and uh, the different types of hammers and, and such. Uh, next, please. So most likely you'll, you're gonna deal more with uh, what we have on the left here, which is a table saw. And remember when we were talking about the different joints, all those joints are cut on a table saw. I can't emphasize enough the importance of, of safety when uh, table saws are, can be quite dangerous if you don't know how to use them. Same way with the circular saw, which is on the right. Make sure that you have a very good understanding and well-trained and use all your um, PPE when using these tools. I'll just say that ahead of time. Uh, but looking at the table saw, understanding what each component is for. So there's a blade guard, which guards the guards from the blade. Uh, the blade itself is raised and lowered with the blade lift handle and the blade lift lock, which locks it into place. 
uh, the fence is, uh, if you look at the fence itself there, you'll see that on the top of the table saw to the right, the fence is where that wood that you're cutting will be guided through there, or it could be guided through with the, uh, you see where it says uh, miter gauge, it's over there, it could be on that being guided through at, at different angles, so that makes those different angle cuts you do that way. Uh, if you're doing some um, rough cutting or uh, just making some um, uh, quick cuts that don't need a lot of accuracy, the, uh, the circular saw, which is to the right, is used there. So you'll see that for a lot of frame and work and such. So uh, the power trigger, the handle, knowing the different components, the um, power source, which is, of course, is the, the cord, uh, or battery. That's another thing on some of these now. I've actually had battery powered. Uh, the blade, the bolt clamp, you know, knowing how that, that uh, bolt goes through there. Most of the time it's a left-handed thread, uh, so the blade doesn't come off. Um, inner washer, outer washer, um, the, the depth lock knob that's on there, the blade cover, the, the bevel adjustment, that's where you can adjust the different angles on the bevel, and uh, the upper guard and the motor. Uh, next, please. And these, I, you know, I left this one in here because I wanted to iterate a little bit. Uh, the framing square, which is definitely different than a, than a combination square. And um, the uh, combination square, you know, you'll see that it also has a level on it, a little green piece there that's a pill level that's in there that's used as well. Um, the layout square, you can get different angles that you can use uh, if you need to lay out a piece of uh, material. And, and it has, it's at a right angle and a 45 there, but you can adjust different angles for ascribing there. The T uh, bevel is used for uh, some very unique angles that you can actually try to duplicate a previous cut and use that to come in there and uh, make some marks on your on your material for a specific project. You just gotta make sure that it's locked in and good and tight. And of course the tape measure is right there. Uh, next please. Uh, when you look at uh, replacing um, uh, ceilings, you know, replacement ceiling, these are test questions, uh, possible test questions. A uh, replacement ceiling uh, can be, it uh, can either be suspended, uh, this is the, the choice is suspended, uh, ceiling tile, foam panels, or A or B. Uh, the doors can be a, um, can be, become hinge bound. Yeah, because of a uh, door stop is too close to the door, the hinges are not spaced appropriately, there's insufficient uh, allowance between the door and the frame, and uh, the hinges are, uh, are set too deep. And next, you should have our answers, please. But, uh, here we go. It's A or B when it comes to uh, ceiling tiles. So they can be suspended or a uh, um, or a, a ceiling tile, right? So a suspended ceiling, we've seen that a lot of times in healthcare. Uh, once in a great while, you may see a ceiling tile that's actually adhered to the material above. Uh, and the next question, answer please, is the hinges are set too deep. So a door can become hinge bound because the hinges are set too deep. And uh, if you can visualize that door that's uh, recessed in there and the hinges being coming too far, it, it can't open up. So that's the depth of the hinges. Uh, next, please. Uh, door closures are installed with the aid of a template, a hammer, hardware plate, second person. Interesting, interesting possibilities there. Uh, the next question is a three inch hole and drywall is best, uh, can best be uh, patched by using uh, spackling, uh, backing the hole and patching it with compound, taping over the hole and applying the uh, surface coat or filling the hole with compound. Now remember this is a three inch hole, okay? And the answers please. Uh, for door closures, that's uh, our best uh, aid is the template. You know, if you if you've got the holes in the wrong location, man, you're in trouble. 
So a hammer definitely is not the answer, right? So you would whack it with a hammer and <laughs> help install it. Uh, hardware play, uh, no. Uh, second person, maybe not a bad idea, but it's the template is the correct answer. And the next answer, please. Backing the hole and patching it with compound. So spackling, you know, of course, is um, a texture that's on the outside. You can't fill it out a three-inch hole with spackling. Um, and taping over the hole, you're going to have this big void behind it. So, you know, if you taped over it, uh, it's very easy to just to push it through. Uh, somebody bumped into it. And filling the hole with compound, the compound's just going to fall out. So it's backing the hole and patching it with compound. Uh, next, please. I like this one. Um, several points are used to uh, hold the uh, countertops from moving, hmm. uh, hang heavy objects, scribe arcs, or find centers. Uh, the next question is uh, the joint uh, showed at the right is a either a rabbit, uh, a dado, a musset, or a miter. I thought about this and I said, you know what, it's pretty tough for to ask you, you know, give you these uh, examples without really um, really showing you what it is uh, in more detail to the right. So uh, answers, please. It is describe an arc. So if you look to the right of that test question, you'll see the Tamel uh, points are used and they're, they're using describe an arc. And that's what they are. They, they attach to a piece of wood and you can use that to describe an arc, you know, one point to the next. Uh, uh, next uh, next one, please. It's a rabbit. So if you look at the joint shown at the right, it's a rabbit cut. And so I kind of brought back those examples I showed you earlier. And if you look at the uh, six squares, the bottom uh, left-hand square is the rabbit joint. And you can see that, that how that is uh, illustrated there and how it's illustrated on the test as well. It's one and the same, same joint. Uh, next question. Uh, the joint shown at the right is cut with uh, what type of blade, okay? And we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. And uh, so is it a rabbit, rabbit blade, a uh, dado blade, muscle blade, or miter blade? Well, think about what that cut is, and that will help guide you to what blade is used. Uh, and the next question is uh, the part of the saw the table saw used to guide the wood as it pushes through the saw is called what? It's either a miter gauge, a fence, a feather board, a miter stops. And the answer is, top question, it's a dado. So it's a dado blade to make the dado cut. And we kind of looked at that dado. If you look at the six square, squares there, the top right hand, it talks about the dado cut. And so that's cut a lot of times on the table saw as you take it across there with a, with a dado blade. And the blade, believe it or not, it looks a lot like a regular blade, but it literally, it, it pivots like this, so it kind of has a wobble, like the earth wobbling as it turns, goes around. It, it wobbles on there, and it actually makes a, a wider cut, can make a wider cut. And how you make that angle changes the width of that cut for the, for the dado. So um, it's a dado blade. So that's a, that's a pretty good one, if you know what the cut is. Uh, the next one is a fence. So remember we talked about uh, parts of, of a table saw used to guide the wood as it is pushed across the saw. It's called a fence. Uh, the, the fences, you know, it guides that wood. You're laying it up next to it, and it's making sure that it, it travels in that uh, uh, perpendicular to the to the um, to the fence. The cut is appropriate, but I cut that. Uh, next one, please. Uh, the tape measure shown is in is is shown in 64 of an inch, 50 seconds of an inch. Uh, standard stud locations are all of the above. If you remember when we talked about uh, the tape measure, um, you know it. It, it's uh, what its increments are. It has uh, 16 of an inch, right? It has eight, eight of an inch. It has quarters of an inch. It has half of an inch. It does not have 64, so it doesn't have 50 seconds of an inch, right? So those two would be incorrect. So if those two are incorrect, the bottom one must be incorrect. And so the only answer left is, Beth, please. 
C, standard stud location. So, so if you think about that, it shows a stud location right there on, uh, I put that on there so that you can see it. So stud locations, which are the vertical pieces uh, used in the wall, um, it can be a different um, a separations. It could be 16, it could be 12s, it could be at 16, 16 inches, it could also be on 24 inches, um, and that's about as far as I've seen most go. But that's, uh, but those are usually indicated on a standard tape measure. So that's a little red box that you see there. Uh, next, please. Uh, I thought this would be good. So uh, the test question is recommended a door, uh, the recommended door size for a wheelchair access must be, and I went ahead and put this in here as 32. If you look at the drawing that's down here, it shows that the door width is 32 and the hall width is 36. Uh, probably the most common mistake on this one would be 36, because we know that you know, the hall width must be at least 36 for a wheelchair to go through it, but it's actually, the question is, what is the door size for a wheelchair? It must be accessed through there. Uh, the next question where it says the upper cabinets are best hung using which of the following? And it's a, a leader strip. So if you look at the very top left-hand corner of the slide, you'll see a, um, a leader that's put on there so that you can place the cabinet on there and then fasten the cabinet to the wall. But it helps uh, guide the common uh, height for the bottom of that cabinet all the way across. So upper cabinets are best hung using the following which is a leader strip. Uh, toggleable, toggle bolts, you know, you may have that type of fasting. Uh, stud finder, probably a good idea, uh, but not necessarily uh, what you really need, the cabinet spacers, you really need to have that leader strip to be able to help out that. Uh, next, please. Yep, good point right there. Uh, next. Okay, last slide, this is important. Upcoming uh, uh, MAC study group sessions are August 26th. It's going to be power plant and boilers. And September the 9th is going to be HVAC uh, and uh, systems. So please, you know, if you're in the study, keep, keep up on attending these classes uh, to try to be ready for the exams, those upcoming exams, uh, the exam that we talked about earlier, those test dates, uh, registration dates. Um, make sure that you have, get registered, make sure that you attend these classes. They really do help. I mean, it makes you, a lot of times it's not telling you exactly what's on there, but it gives you some ideas of, of what to study and how to study to be prepared for the test. And I hope this session today, you know, helped you uh, be prepared. And I, you know, I look forward to seeing you, especially at the NorCal. I'll be at the NorCal uh, session up there. And I hope to see each and every one of you. And I, I would love to have a very, very high success rate and see that each one of your institutions puts on your on your shirt, it says MAC certified. I'd like to see that patch on it too. So if uh, you get that, uh, it makes a difference. I know career-wise, um, you know, a lot of times we're kind of unsung, but as administration is continuing to observe and appreciate uh, the technical savvy of our uh, of our our teams in engineering. This is one more way to prove that that knowledge that you have and to gain more knowledge. I, I learn every time I study these things, and um, I'm definitely I'm not an expert at all things. Uh, we always say mechanical engineers know a little bit of everything, but nothing in depth. Well, that's pretty true, but um, you know, you guys have each one of you have the most technical skills out there that in your field of, of study and expertise, this is a great way to broaden that, to give yourself more opportunities uh, going forward in your career, and to give you recognition for that knowledge that you, you obtain. And you truly do create the, the environment for healing for all the doctors and nurses uh, to be able to perform and do this work. Uh, anybody have any questions that are out there? Got a, I got a couple minutes here. Oh, good. Oh man, I was hoping Jeff would give me a good singer here because Jeff is Jeff is a good carpenter, so uh, very good carpenter. Uh, let's see here. Oh, Mike. Oh, all right. 
Well, again, thank you very much for attending the class today. Um, look forward to seeing you at the at the next next two that are coming up. And uh, I'll give you back a few minutes. Thank you much. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you Charles. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Beth. Thank you. All right, Charles. Thank you. Thank you.